and gentlemen. Uh, Can I please have your attention? Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. This is my last um, uh, recording before I hit the road on my big adventure. Um, and the reason why, so one reason why we're recording now is because this is my last opportunity to record. And also because a uh, longtime friend and now, and also colleague of the remnant, uh, fan favorite going way, way back, Scott Lincecum, who writes the capitalism newsletter, a must read for anybody who actually cares about how markets actually work and how various regulations and industrial planning doesn't, um, uh, has a big new project as as the as a as as a, he's a suit now at Cato. He's no longer part of the toiling masses. He's management at Cato, and uh, he wanted to come on to talk about this new project that he has. And I said, I be he has an open. We have an open door policy to Scott Lindsay come on this podcast. So Scott, welcome back to the Remnant. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yes, yeah. I am officially. I've graduated from the proletariat. Um, and now am uh, among the moneyed classes. Uh, it's uh, it's it's big 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 days uh, at at Cato and at for capitalism. Um, well, I mean, you are nothing if not a fan of upward mobility. Exactly. Well, I, you know, I I like to say I you know I started out. It is I mean it is kind of cool, right? I started out as an intern at Cato in the nineties, um, an absolute you know idiot kid. Uh, and then went away and of course practiced law and did all that, but to come back and now be, be doing pretty well is it's, it's fun. Uh, it's neat to, you know, every, really every time I walk in the building, you know, I kind of think back to, to a long time ago. Yeah. I, I have similar views about relationship with AI. I first started there as an intern and, um, but I've studiously avoid managing people, um, in any, in any way, but then I fell over it with the dispatch, so I can't escape it. Um, so you have this new big, massive project going yeah. called Defending Globalism. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and uh, it has remarkably little to do, obviously, with nachos, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I'm, sure you can, I'm sure you can work it in. I'm we sure did, you can. I did. Um, I'm sure there's going to be an I nacho uh, essay, but... Um, why don't you just sort of explain what you're doing and then we'll move to the substance and then we'll come back to the, the bells and whistles and all that. So the, the product is uh, Defending Globalization. Um, it is much like the title sounds. Um, it originated from out of frustration, really, after oh, sometime about you know late last year. I had read just one too many op-ed or straight journalism piece that really treated decades of unfettered globalization, unfettered free trade and migration as objectively bad, um, you know, fueling, you know, a, a deindustrialization and worker resentment and, you know, sad puppies, you name it. Um, and doing it really, like I said, as a, a one-sided affair. And of course, you get this in the punditry, but to see it also creeping into kind of the general narrative, right, the kind of conventional wisdom was very frustrating. And it's frustrating for, I think, you know, a bunch of reasons. The most obvious one is, look, being a student of this stuff, um, some of it's just factually wrong. You know, how the World Trade Organization operates, how comparative advantage works or tariffs work um, is is a, a fact. These are facts. We have like written histories of how the WTO came about. We have written histories of U.S. tariff policy. We know about, you know, whether the United States really is this kind of unfettered free trade market, which of course it isn't. Um, so, so that was frustrating. But the other frustrating thing, and I think we all, I, even I fall victim to this sometimes, is portraying globalization as something kind of new and that was just kind of cooked up in a lab by Larry Summers and Milton Friedman, I guess, like in Davos in the 90s, right? And they just, they said, let's do globalization. And they foisted upon the unwitting working masses all around the world, much to our dismay, right? And it's fueled all those bad, bad things I mentioned. Um, and that's just nonsense. Um, the fact is that, that globalization in some form, what you just long distance trade and migration, 
has gone on in some form or another since you know the dawn of recorded history, basically, uh, dating back at least to like 3000 BC, we now have evidence of this. So people have been doing this for a long, long time. And at its essence, um, all we're really talking about um, is not trade deficits, and we're certainly not talking about Team America versus Team Japan or Team China or whatever. Um, it is very much about people in two places um, doing business together or moving or whatever for their for their mutual benefit for the, for their gain. Um, now, certainly, governments, modern governments, become involved. They lower tariffs. They enter into trade agreements. They do bad things. You know, whether it's, uh, it's subsidies or industrial policy or whatever, or of course, much worse things related to human rights and the rest. But uh, we, if we lose sight of the fact that, again, we are really talking about this kind of fundamentally human thing, that's, um, then I think it can lead to a lot of bad policy because you end up, um, I mean, you know, the media routinely, of course, they want to focus on bad news, but also just to kind of lose sight of who gets caught up in these geopolitical struggles or efforts to rebalance trade or whatever. If you don't actually talk about, hey, these are actually people, these are small business owners, or they're just a guy who um, uh, has, has started a, you know, his own thing, whatever it is, right? Um, and people um, engaging in that. And again, migration also being a lot of that as well, right? Um, you know, we talk a lot about chaos at the southern border and all this stuff. And certainly there's there's all truths to that. But there's also this kind of bigger human element that, that I think was lost. Um, and so the goal of the project is uh, twofold. One is to really correct the record. Um, what is globalization? What has happened in the United States and abroad? Um, and uh, what are the kind of fundamental uh, things that you need to know. So, you know, we're going to have explanatory essays on the WTO, World Trade Organization, like I mentioned, and on comparative advantage, of course, why it's at top of mind. Um, and then we'll also, though, get into some of the weeds about what really has happened with uh, the global race to the bottom. I mean, how about, how's thing, how are things in developing countries? Where has globalization and migration played roles in all of this? Um, so we'll look at the at the facts on that. But then the other thing is to really get at the humanity of a lot of this stuff. You know, you mentioned nachos and I mean, it's, it's beyond caricature, but I do mention nachos because I wrote an essay that'll be coming out in a couple months um, on globalization and food. Um, the fact is that there's probably no better example of evil globalism or whatever you want to call it. There's probably no better example than the restaurant down the street. Right, so you're probably eating cuisine that did not come, you know, come from America or isn't even American cuisine. Um, you're probably drinking uh, a beverage, a frosty beverage that has imported ingredients or is itself, you know, a glass of Australian wine. Uh, the people who work there probably going to be some immigrants, uh, or the owners of the place are going to be immigrants. Um, the ingredients in the food, even if you're having a burger and fries, the most American, which by the way, fries are Belgium. Uh, Belgium uh, even if you're going to have that, the ingredients are going to be sourced from all over the world. Um, and all that is is part of the good of globalization, the humanity of globalization that happens every day of our lives and that we never, ever talk about, like ever. Uh, and so we're going to have uh, ones on film and on art and music and, like I mentioned, food uh, to get at some of those things too. So Again, to kind of have a richer discourse about all of these things, um, because it didn't really seem like anybody else was doing this, right? You know, you can get the occasional piece, but nobody ran a kind of concerted effort. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, one is, and this is generally true across a whole range of issues, there are a lot of young journalists who just don't know a lot about the stuff they're covering. And so I'm not saying they're not smart. Some of them are very smart and all that kind of stuff, but they, they think the world started this morning um, or when they graduated from college and they bring with them a lot of conventional wisdom that they just sort of take as, as gospel. The other thing, just going back to the beginning is um, I have a rule of thumb that anytime I hear anybody talking about anything being unfettered. I know that they are trying to smuggle in claims that are not right, like unfigured, like remember the Enron stuff? That was because of unfettered regulation, deregulation in, right. in California and unfettered capital. Like, everywhere I look, I see a lot of fettering. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying all fettering is bad, but the idea that like there's one among anarchy and um, and just pure capitalist, you know, trade or or regulatory policy, it's just not it's never true anywhere. Yeah. Right. And and if you don't start at those kind of basic fundamental facts, um, OK, you know what? Yes, we did liberalize tariffs over uh, several decades. Um, of course, uh, you know, average tariff rates, even after the Trump stuff, are still pretty low in the United States. Um, but my gosh, we have all of these other uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers out there. We have all these restrictions on services and and uh, on other types of trade. Uh, migration, of course. You know, my colleagues just published that amazing video game about you know you try to get a green card, and it's you basically the whole point of the game is you always lose, right? It's that hard. Um, and it, and so yeah, and and that you know gets to another of these kind of fundamental objective truths is that we live in a mixed system, right? We have some free trade stuff. We have a lot of not free trade stuff. And it's important to start there and explain that and understand that. So we have an essay on what are free trade agreements? Like, why do we have free trade agreements? Um, you know, if free trade's so good, why don't we just liberalize all tariffs. That's right. Why do we do that? Why don't we do this? Um, so, so we we have uh, my my former colleague Simon, who's a trade lawyer and who writes um, a a ton on that stuff. Kind of explains how do these things come about? Um, how they're kind of second best policy, but they're the best we can do um, in the political realities, right? And and how they've evolved over. That's the other thing, right? They, these things have evolved over. Uh, decades, almost centuries in some cases, but in the trade agreement context for for decades. Um, and why? Well, they they were the result of a lot of bad trial and error. We we tried a bunch of stuff. I always joke that America is somewhat of a reluctantly free trading nation in the sense that we we had decades and decades of really bad policy, and then world wars with you know competing factions of uh, trading blocks, and they they thought you know. They, Okay, let's let's try something a little different, um, because there were so many so many messes. And then you know you go to the 1980s. We experimented a ton with industrial policy in the 70s and 80s, uh, and it's just important to kind of get that foundation. And so we're hoping that this this project was a multi year project and has all these moving parts. We're hoping that part of it is just to be like kind of a, a one stop shop for people, whether they're journalists or Hill staff or normies listening to the podcast. I want you know have normies listening to this podcast, but you know, uh, you know, can have, okay, I want to learn about this subject and I'm going to do it in a quick way. That's, and that's the other thing we, we don't, these are not 60 page policy papers. They're going to be pretty quick essays on, on individual subjects so that you can, you know, get in and out in 30 minutes, um, maybe even shorter if you're a quick reader and, and know a little something more about a certain topic. So, I mean, on the substance side of this, um, and it sounds like a great project and I, and you sent me some mock-ups of some stuff and they all look really cool and I, I will be using it often, I'm sure. But, um, so, I mean, one of the, one of the points that as a matter of political analysis, I'm always find myself having to make is that a lot of the, a lot of the blaming of problems on immigration and a lot of the blaming of problems on offshoring the industrial base um, are usually not wholly because I mean we did some offshoring, right? Yeah. And immigra low skilled immigration is disruptive sometimes, and we can talk about that. But um, the dr the biggest driver that no one wants to talk about is automation. Yeah. And you know when you replace. A um, hundred guys on the assembly line with five guys who know how to run the robots. Um, that's a lot of lost jobs, but it's also yeah. an increase in productivity, right? right? And it's also so like the actual amount of I, you constantly hear people say we don't make things in this country anymore, but we do. We just yeah. fewer human beings do it, yeah. um, which is a different thing. So can you walk me through that? Like, do you have numbers about how much automation is a, is is a driver or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. So there's not. Unfortunately, there's no. There's no great easy answer. The the way to put it, I think, is over the long term. Even folks who who write, you know, like the China shock essays and stuff. Over the long term, I think you'd say. 75, 80% of job losses in manufacturing are related to some type of productivity uh, 
gains. Um, technology and automation being the big one, but they're not the only ones. You know, when we talk about uh, productivity and manufacturing, you know, oh, well, it's robots. Well, it's actually not just that. It's computers and the 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 uh, Excel and all these other programs, right, that do this. It's business practices, um, which does is kind of part of a globalization thing. You know, you learn Lean Six Sigma from the J- Japanese or whatever, and you, um, or first, uh, um, uh, you know, real-time inventorying and all that kind of stuff that, that also enhances productivity. So in general, over the long, long term, uh, you're you're looking at the vast majority related to stuff like that and not to globalization um, or trade or whatever. Now, undeniably true that uh, trade, whether it's with Mexico or China or Europe or Japan or whatever, has undoubtedly led to some companies or industries um, uh, shrinking, if not disappearing, and I'm not not they're still around a little bit, but getting pretty small. Um, so reductions in jobs and and certain types of companies and and disruptions in communities that depended, you know, Milltown uh, that only has one company in it. If that company struggles, right, that's going to be an issue. Um, but it's it's the it's an exception. And the other big point is that. That those same forces are producing a lot of really good things, and they're producing a lot of really good things, not for the moneyed globalists of the world or whatever. I mean, certainly multinational corporations and investors can benefit, um, but they're producing a ton of benefits for the very people that are that are being allegedly harmed, um, and that. They are doing so in the very places, these very communities we hear so much about, um, that are rebuilding those places. You know, the place that I talk about all the time, I can never stop talking about it, uh, is Greenville, South Carolina, right? So this is a textile town. This is a place that in the 1970s was getting its lunch eaten by uh, globalization and textiles and apparel. And Greenville has is still a thriving place, but it's now a thriving place with a lot of multinational manufacturing. There's a big BMW plant there. There's a Michelin tire plant, uh, but there's also a lot of services, and uh, it is a modern economy, and it's booming, and it's you know now one of the best places to live in the country, uh, struggling with high real estate prices because everybody wants to live there. So these types of things happen, but the same forces that are causing the initial problems, disruption, whatever you want to call it, are also the things that are a lifeline out of that as well. And you, so you have to, and that's, again, a big part of this project. So we have an essay on deindustrialization. We have an essay you know, that gets into what's actually happening, not just with the US manufacturing sector, but with the global sector. Because you know, those job losses happened in Europe too. They happened in, in Asia. Um, they're now happening in China. China has lost millions of manufacturing jobs, not to mention all their other economic problems. So these are kind of seismic things that happen to economies as they evolve and as they develop. And we need to have that understanding um, or we end up with, well, we end up with a lot of the stuff you hear and read in the press and in, about rampant deindustrialization caused by China, right? That's it. That's, that's all that happened, which is not nearly uh, correct. Yeah. So I, first of all, I want to say, I appreciate you bringing the correct uh, mocking pronunciation of globalization right, right. for the remnant. But um, uh, it's funny, if you go back and you look at, I was recently for something else, I was looking at what sort of the egghead conversation about globalization in the 1990s. And back then it was a lot of WTO stuff. It was a lot of um, um, you know, the sort of Marxist no logo kind of movements and uh, and remember, uh, Greek protesters kind of swarmed Bill Clinton in, in Greece, which would make sense because they were Greek. Um, and it was before Bono kind of discovered that, holy crap, turns out that markets help poor people more than like bureaucracies do. And, and um, but then some change to the flavor of it, right? And then so in the 2000s and the 2010s, It went from primarily anti-globalization was primarily a left wing thing, culturally sort of uh, kind of thing. And I always thought it was kind of hypocritical because the same crowd also wanted the U.N. to do more, which is very globalist. Right. And um, um, and it moved right as sort of less about whatever the I'm not even sure what they were talking about in the 90s, but it, it stopped being that stuff. 
and started more being like attacks on sovereignty and world government. And you had Lou Dobbs talking about how they were going to impose a global currency or North American currency. You know, we were going to have to share grubby money with Canadians and Mexicans and got really paranoid and weird. And and this sort of gets to the, sort of the other this, the reason why I, I think the project is such a good one is there's so many things that need to be disentangled. Right. And so like when a lot of people whine about or fret about globalization, the globalization they're talking about isn't necessarily the same globalization as what somebody else is talking about. And like, I'm against one world government, um, but that doesn't mean I'm against free trade. And, um, and that's the kind of thing that kind of needs to be teased out. Yeah, for sure. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing these in kind of short snippets is to try to isolate the issues. So, you know, you mentioned global government. So, yeah, we have an essay on just the basic facts of the World Trade Organization, like what it is, where it came from, what it does, does it infringe on sovereignty, all those types of things. So just kind of in a very kind of myth versus fact, we had uh, Jim Bacchus, who's the former WTO appellate body chair and former congressman who's it knows this stuff better than almost anybody on the planet, just kind of giving you an explainer of sorts. Uh, so it's, you need to, and you need to disentangle that from, again, from the kind of deindustrialization stuff, from the, from all of the different elements, but you need to do it, right? We all have very short attention spans now. You can't, you're not going to, don't write a book, right? Do you get this quickly. But then, you know, we're doing other fun things that are hopefully going to do the same type of education in new ways. So you know, we'll do some new videos. Um, you know, Cato has this amazing new auditorium that we're going to exploit like crazy for the project. Um, we're going to make a t-shirt and then track its own supply chain so that you can actually see how this stuff works. The interesting thing about that is the t-shirt is probably, we think it's going to be made in Guatemala, yet 90% of the value add and the effort came from Americans and not just at Cato, but everybody involved in the logistics and the design and everything is all Americans. The only thing that happened in Guatemala was the actual sewing, you know, of, of the shirt. So um, we're going to do an interactive quiz. You can test yourself on if you're really a true globalist or, uh, or whether you're a politician. Um, no, but so, and, you know, other ways to kind of get and learn about these things in, in ways that aren't your just standard 50 page policy paper. Cause look, I love 50 page policy papers. I eat them for breakfast, but most people don't. Right. So we were trying to, to get at that. And, uh, like you said, to kind of do it in a way that separates the issues and gives you a bite size uh, meal uh, of sorts, just so that you know, get in, get out, learn about it, move on. Um, but like I said, but also I'm, I'm hoping so. A lot of these will be fun too. I, I really do think this food essay is fun. It really gets into. I know that you know some colleagues of mine read it and they said, yeah, it was actually like entertaining to to learn about some different things because there's some really kind of crazy aspects of food culture. Um, the number of cuisines that are in the United States these days, how countries develop their cuisines, all that kind of stuff. That's neat. And then we're going to do the same thing for you know all these other cultural things as well. So um, there's a lot. It's a lot of I think fun content as well as uh, informational stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it'd be fun if you could get a good cultural libertarian to go hammers and tongs, hammer and tongs against the idea of uh, that only certain ethnicities can make their own food yeah. because otherwise it's cultural appropriation, which food always everywhere has been about cultural appropriation. And that's one of the things that makes food great. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's funny you say that because I, uh, I mean, in researching this piece, uh, yeah, you just see that dating back, I mean, as far, again, it goes back to forever. I mean, the Italian pasta was actually taken from China, right? And so these things, um, that's what but that's art too, you know, food being kind of art, you know, it's always borrowing. So we have, we're going to do an essay on fashion and, and how these, these things are all kind of mixed together um, and that people have been borrowing and stealing and doing this for forever. And, um, you know, certainly we can we can talk about the downsides and that's fine. But if you don't look at all the benefits uh, and this long, long history of this happening, um, then you're really missing the, the bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun if you actually go through all of the foodstuffs that came from the Colombian exchange, you know, from the New World, and you, you take them out and like, first of all, Irish cuisine without potatoes is a strange thing, right? And, and Italian cuisine without pasta, European cuisine without 
tomatoes is just a hot mess, right? And yeah. it turns out that people were eating pretty grubby tuber filled stew out of a communal pot before all these other things came from other places. Well, the, the most one of the most fascinating things I learned, and I I'm, I hate to be giving away much of the content of the essay, but um, Thailand got pe- hot peppers also mm-hmm. from from the same type of trade, the Colombian huh. period. And so I, I had no idea. I thought, oh, I mean, Thailand peppers, that's like, no, no, that that was all brought over. Um, and then if you actually look in Southeast Asia, and you know, of course, look, colonization's bad. There's a lot of bad parts of it. But you can see the countries that were next door to each other, um, like Vietnam and Thailand, that actually developed entirely different cuisines based on the international influences. So one being colonized, one not, and their cuisines basically split. Um, So they share some of the same flavors, but they do all these weird things um, or different things because of that. And so this is just the type of fun, cool, interesting stuff. Um, Another area out of the kind of cultural area that is critically important are ideas um, for research and science. Um, you know, the United States has long, long been this um, place for, for global research collaboration. Um, U.S. scholarly research more often than any other uh, place uh, cites foreigners in terms of the types of stuff, we, the re- research we put out and the patents and the rest. Um, and so, you know, it is just uh, it critical when we hear these ideas of bringing everything home and just doing it ourselves and America first and stuff. And you think, you know, that's not just about tariffs. Um, there's a, a lot of this that goes on that um, is critically important and that would be, you know, you'd be throwing out the baby with the bathwater with a lot of this as well. Um, the other thing that I, I note, and I'm kind of, that's an awkward segue, but uh, the types of trade we talk about. I, I joked throughout this project, if I see one more damn container ship, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> because, well, that's, you know, if you, anytime you, if you type globalization into the Google mm-hmm. image search or whatever, you're going to get a container ship, right? You might get a, right. a globe or whatever. But uh, the reality is that we have um, rapidly increasing services trade around the world. Digital trade happens all the time um, and happens in a lot of ways we don't even think about. You know, you think about something like Squid Game on Netflix. Well, that's a Korean show produced by an American company in Korea and then streamed into our homes using an Amazon or whatever device you have is probably made somewhere in Asia. Um, You know, all of this happens um, and it happens instantaneously. And then, you know, we're stuck in the political space debating tariff rates. Like, it's like so like, it's like you know, 18th century policy in, a, in the 21st century. So that's another part of this. We're going to try to get people talking about what actually is globalization today. And a lot of it is in the digital space. And in a lot of ways that, by the way, you and I barely even understand, you know, it's, it's the kids um, trading virtual currencies by when playing Fortnite or virtual goods in Fortnite. Uh, it's, of course, Bitcoin and crypto and all that kind of stuff. So we have a, a, an essay on, on cryptocurrency as well. All that kind of stuff, again, it, it never is discussed. It's just a darn container, <laughs> darn container ship and tariff rights. And even the container ship discussions can be uh, terrible because we ignore just how much of the global trade in goods was driven by technology, like the container, right? So um, that's the other part of this is to, tr- is to pull back the idea that all of this was top down. It was all by, again, just elite globalists got in a room and did this when in reality, it was more like they were always doing this. Then government got in the way with tariffs and trade restrictions and all this kind of stuff. And now we've just been peeling back some of those restrictions over time. And then, of course, as technology is driving the bus more often than, than even the policy. So let's, um, let's, let's talk about industrial policy for a second. Sure. Um, first of all, like... It seems to me that, again, I'm just thinking of things that need to be disentangled. We have a conversation about tariffs and stuff, and then we have a conversation about industrial policy. But industrial policy strikes me as essentially a form of tariff or, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, subsidies are tariffs and tariffs are subsidies, right? And then it just depends on, on how many dots you need to connect to, to explain all that, right? And so industrial policy strikes me as most of the time you're basically subsidizing a domestic industry at the expense of, of foreign competition. And yeah, uh, you know, we could probably have a, 
disagreements at the margins about like stuff about how how far under the umbrella of national security something is before right. you would say it's okay like you know uh, nuclear stuff maybe we should make on our own soil for specific reasons and then yes very quickly we might disagree about some other things right um but um um the industrial policy thing in china the 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 thing that's kind of driving me crazy about that debate is you just see it starting to spring up now is that in part because it's the narrative that china kind of wants out there is that china is turning to command and control economics because capitalism has failed yeah and and then the the other way to look at it is to turn the causal arrow around and say that um capitalism is failing because they're turning to command and control techniques and i i think it's sort of a both and thing in a certain sense because if you if you been if you read up on g he basically acknowledges that capitalism made china rich but it also made china too free and that's freaking them out right and so he would rather lose some points on the gdp scoreboard in favor of order and stability and control yeah um how do you look at it? i mean it, it, china feels to me like there are a lot of people who should have more egg on their face about the sort of japan japan inc replay right yeah yeah so so you you have to st well first i'll say you know obviously china isn't japan in some some important ways but right. you're right that a lot of the playbook is the same and this is definitely something for you capitalisters out there i'm going to get into this fall um and we actually have two essays already done um, that we'll put out for this project, one on how China got rich and then what happened to China. Because really, the way I like to think of of modern China, post-1980-ish China, is really two epochs. There's uh, the liberalization period. So really, late 1970s through the 1980s, um, China was kind of peeling away the communism. And doing this in a lot of ways, um, property rights and privatization and uh, policy reform and trade as well, um, liberalizing trade. Uh, and then, of course, joining the World Trade Organization eventually in, um, in finally in 2000. And so, so that's, I think, period one and still was a you know, mixed economy still had vestiges of these controls, still had, of course, CCP in power and all that, but was was liberalizing and was starting from a dirt poor pace, which made it made made the successes look even better, right? Because they had they had been punching themselves in the face for decades and decades, and then they kind of stopped, and then one fist, you know, started doing other stuff, um, and they got credit for this amazing liberalization. But of course, it still had um, uh, statist elements. But then um, period two is really uh, starting in the late 2000s and then ramping up rapidly in the 2010s and beyond. And that's when they, they started more with uh, really kind of straight up industrial policy, really getting into heavy industrial subsidies. They had this Made in China 2025 plan. Um, they targeted specific technologies. They were very overt about we're going to take, we're going to be global leaders in these things, which of course freaked out American politicians and businesses. Um, but it's that period where you started to see state-owned enterprises reasserting themselves. You started to see uh, reforms that we thought were on the way kind of disappear into the ether. Um, and that's where a lot of the problems are now. Um, you know, uh, we'll leave aside demographics because that's not an industrial policy problem. That's a very different problem. But if you look at- But it was some, a policy problem, right? It was a state planning problem about what, well, you can even call it a, work, a workforce planning screw up. Yeah, for sure. But that's a, you know, <laughs> for sure. But you're seeing now, um, you know, so one of the big problems in China's economy is um, misallocated resources. So whether it's property bubbles or uh, graveyards full of old EVs, um, they have a lot of, of resource misallocation. But the other big thing is productivity. You know, China is still, they're still relatively poor on a per capita basis. And they, the way to get rich, particularly since they don't have a booming population, is to boost productivity. Well, the problem is that uh, given the rise in state-owned enterprises and the reassertion of, of industrial policy, it's just not uh, a very 
productive place and productivity isn't anywhere near the Western frontier. And that's going to, that's just creating problems. And then you combine all that with the G stuff, right? Uh, the COVID zero mess, the cracking down on private investors. They, you know, they had these like booming tech sectors, uh, like, uh, education, for example, um, like online tutoring and stuff. Uh, and of course the TikTok and Tencent stuff. Um, and then they said, no, that's, you guys are getting too rich. You're getting too powerful. Uh, and, and they cracked down on that. And the combination of all these things, along with all the geopolitical things, cause they've been doing stupid stuff, um, with wolf warrior diplomacy and terrible stuff with Zhen Zhang, um, stuff with Belt and Road that the Belt and Road initiative and these uh, crazy loans they were handing out, which has also bitten them. Um, but you put it all together and it's just not a, not a good looking place these days. And uh, they have a lot of headwinds. And on the one hand, just to circle back to your first point, I'm pleased because, you know, I've, I've been writing on some of these headwinds. Um, you know, I'm not a China collapse guy, but I've said, look, we need to stop treating this economy like this unstoppable state-led juggernaut that we have to mirror um, or abandon Western capitalism to beat, right? Um, we, we should acknowledge where real threats lie, uh, but in general, we, we should also be per- pretty confident in our system versus, versus theirs. Well, in the one sense, I'm thrilled to see a lot of a lot more of this discourse in the wake of the the problems that they're they're having these days. Um, on the other hand, though, yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm kind of want a reckoning of sorts yeah. because we didn't seem to have one after the Japan stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the same guys that wrote the Japan is eating our lunch books then came out with the China is going to eat our lunch books uh, 20, 30 years later, and they're just you know that's fine. It's just memory hold, uh, and that. That's frustrating for sure. But look, uh, you know, we're just getting into this, so we'll we'll see what happens next. But it is it is a bit odd to to have there not be more recognition of the man. You really botched that that call, right? Yeah. So my my, my take on this going way back um, is that there's a a rich history of technocratic experts in the United States cherry picking the sort of Potemkin version of what they see as successful economic planning in other countries, right? In the late 19th century, there was a lot of that vis-a-vis Germany. People, well, even earlier than that, there was all these people who thought like Frederick the Great, you know, this autocrat who ran, literally ran Prussia, was like what, the, what an enlightened dictator and what an enlightened government should be. And then there was Bismarck, they all got, got you know, too messant about Bismarck. And then you had in the... 20s and 30s, you had all of these American technocrats go gaga over both Bolshevism and for a while, fascism and Nazism. Um, you know, you had Lincoln Steffens. Everyone remembers that he went to the Soviet Union and said, I've been to the future. I've seen the future and it works. Um, people forget he's, the year before he said the same thing about fascist Italy. The New Republic was all giddy about these guys. And all it ever is, is this thing that says, see, they honor their intellectuals and technocrats over there. And when you give them the power that we want here, you get these great successes and they don't acknowledge the failures because that would undermine their whole case for how they want to be given the keys to everything. And and that's why industri- the industrial policy thing keeps always comes back, whether it's on. The, usually it's been on the left for most of our lives. But now you have people like Peter Navarro and those kind of guys that say, see, we know how to jigger the dials. We know how to twist this just right. And then we can guarantee a great economy because we know how to set tariffs or we know how to subsidize certain industries in ways that um, will guarantee the results that we allege exist abroad, as if like Hungary has really figured out industrial policy. Yeah. And, and there's also, I think, um, you know, it's a classic punditry case of where they're looking at these economies from 40,000 feet or, you know, in, in this case, 5,000 miles. And uh, they see, oh, look, they they produced a bunch of ships or a bunch of steel and ergo, it's a success, right? And, you know, I wrote a column um, not too long ago about this. I called it toddler economics because you're only focusing on, aha, a single output. It's a success. And then you don't look at all of the unseen. What What's going on with the duck's legs under the water, right? Um, and we're seeing some of that finally coming out in China, right? Uh, the guy, Lee Branstetter, who's kind of just a, a 
champ has been he's an economist who's been writing several papers on Chinese industrial policy and he's actually looking at how these things have actually worked he's finding that Chinese didn't pick a lot of winners they subsidized a lot of unproductive industries they didn't boost uh, the, um, the industries themselves uh, and of course there's corruption and uh, mis resource misallocation all that kind of stuff and we seem to maybe be seeing it in electric vehicles too um, in you know that Bloomberg piece about the EV graveyards is nuts. For those who haven't heard of it, just Google it. I mean, just fields full of old EVs that are now getting covered in weeds because they've just been left to, to rot. Um, and then bankruptcies and corruption. And so, um, you know, sure, China has uh, now the Chinese government industrial policy has seems to have produced some some big winners in the EV space, but the book isn't written, and there's a lot of losers. Um, and if you don't, again, if you don't have an even-handed look at this, uh, you end up with a lot of that really bad punditry. Yeah, I mean, so and part of the point, and I wrote about this a little bit recently, is that part of the problem is that I'm not saying that people who are in favor of tariffs are corrupt, right? That's not my point, but tariffs are a form of legalized corruption in yeah. the sense that you are not do if you're running if you're on the board of a normal company you have a fiduciary obligation to like put things out for bid right and have and get the best vendors and and look at like cost benefit analysis across a whole bunch of layers to get, do do things with integrity the right way tariffs in in industrial policy are kind of like a legal philosophy, a political philosophy excuse to give jobs to your nephews. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's, to reward your friends who happen to be your neighbors and, you know, they help you and you help them and that kind of stuff, because it, it introduces political calculations for how you allocate resources that are much more subjective and loosey goosey. And, and so like, when you look at, our financial crisis, 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008, the Chinese spiked the football on us endlessly oh, yeah. saying, this is what capitalism leads to and blah, 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 blah. And like, I remember writing at the time, I was like, okay, as bad as our system, as bad as the things that we did that led to the financial crisis, 2000, 2008, a huge amount of it had to do with the equivalent of that kind of corruption of industrial policy, which is enforced opacity, reward. It, pushing benefits to political constituencies, regardless of whether the market ratified that decision, um, obscuring the truth of things by bundling them up and all sorts of things that were impossible to understand, yeah. even under in the free market, um, making political priorities more important than market priorities. China has been doing that with its real estate sector, its housing sector, and who knows what other sector, the EV sector and all this kind of stuff for decades. And there's yeah. no political accountability. There's no journalism that can get to the heart of it. There's no like right. truth commission or Senate hearings that are going to reveal for the public to understand how this stuff happened. It's all done in secret for the benefit of the prestige of the Communist Party, Communist Chinese Party. And how that can not lead to disaster eventually right. strikes me as impossible. Yeah, and there's an informational, uh, really important informational thing. And, you know, this is another uh, column I wrote a little while ago um, about how, you know, when you're an autocracy, right, um, you know, you, you have a informational problem from the top down and the bottom up. The, the bottom up, they don't really want to tell you what's going on exactly, right? Because if, if they bring you bad news, then the next thing you know, they don't exist anymore. Um, and then there's a, a top-down problem where the top-down guys, they want to portray outwardly, you know, a, a booming, successful system. So this creates all sorts of informational problems that, look, for our messy, Western, open, liberal society, um, you know, we have our, our errors are generally out in the open, right? And that voters eventually, usually in the long term, uh, correct for those or markets very surely do. Um, and that that's a it's a messy system, but it, it in the long run, it's it's better. Um, the other thing I would say that you kind of got into about industrial policy, one of the reasons why uh, I'm anti-protectionism, anti-industrial policy is I understand just how seductive these things are for politicians. Um, I mean, you get to go get your golden shovel and dig in the ground and get that photo op. You get to point to exact jobs that you protected or created. You get to go to that factory and say, this is mine or whatever, you know, you name it the Robert Byrd Memorial Factory, you know, whatever, right? And, and that, and the problem then is it just leads to more of that. 
Um, and it leads to this, uh, I sort of pun intended, race to the bottom in policymaking where you have, and we're seeing it right now with you know Trump's tariffs and then Biden's tariffs, and then now Trump's going to up the game one more, and you get this kind of terrible cycle. So for people who who understand the economic harms, but also the political economy harms of all of this, you just you just just say no, right? You know, just say no um, because it it's bad. It can it can be pretty bad, and it's hard to turn off. That's the other thing. You know, once it gets going, and you have politicians committed to this. Once you have the Robert Byrd Memorial Factory churning out widgets, um, you well, you don't want to ever have that factory fail because it's got your name on it. Right. So, and that's the other, it's just really hard to stop. So um, yeah, you just never start. That's, that's the solution. Um, all right. So let's turn to something where we probably have marginal disagreements on, um, mm -hmm. on immigration, right? Sure. So one of my great beefs with, 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 with good faith, decent, patriotic libertarians is that um like me like me like you <laughs> like you uh no there's a there's a, there's a certain amount of argumentation about things like immigration that have the sort of net result of reducing voters citizens whatever you want to call them uh people into homo economicus yeah and the problem is is that that First of all, in a mixed system, which we talked about earlier, right, in a mixed system where there is a welfare state and where there are benefits that are allocated according to, you know, income and, and poverty and all these kinds of things, and there are scarce resources in other parts of the, the social sector, even if I don't agree necessarily that immigrants are a net drain on those things the way some people do, I mean, but at the margins, you can see this kind of stuff. And you can certainly see it in the context of the refugee crisis we have right now at the border where you have the mayor of New York talking about how New York City is going to come unglued because of all of this, right? So like existing programs, you know, Milton Friedman used to always say if you didn't have a welfare state, there was no argument for, you know, any, barring any immigration, right? And there was a sort of idea that somehow immigration would undermine the welfare state. I'm not sure that that's worked out that way. But so the problem with the libertarian approach tends to be um, that because it discounts the, it, it kind of looks down its nose at the political ramifications of immigration, it ends up finding itself buying an, a worse backlash against immigration than it otherwise would if it could just simply tolerate sort of a more middle of the road regulatory regime for immigration. So where do you come down on like, I assume, I know you think legal immigration is good for America, so do I, but like, where do you come down on the backlash against, against immigration generally? And, and what yeah. is your answer to people who say, you know, we can't have open borders? Right. So I think the place to start is with what system do we have now? Um, and how many people are we actually letting in? How free is our immigration system? Because I think once you, and that goes back to, you know, I talked about that amazing video game that my colleagues made. And, and they also, there was an accompanying paper, I shared it in my newsletter, um, just showing how impossible it is. Your chances are uh, one 2% maybe that you can make it through the system. You're going to spend a fortune. So it's, it's first to start with what is our current system and how, and what is that system doing? That's the next step. So I think we need to, uh, hopefully we can all accept that um, we are not a open borders country. We, it is not easy to come to the United States. We have all sorts of rules and regulations and visa caps and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so you start there. Then the next step is to say, well, what are the what are the the harms of that system? Um, well, one is it actually fuels illegal immigration, right? It's so hard, and people are so desperate um, that that they're gonna they're gonna come here anyway. Um, and and so that's I think really important. The other thing is, of course, what what are the effects of the people who do come here? Generally, it's good. Generally, they are not using up. Uh, all the public services. They are not committing the crimes. Uh, they are not terrorists. Um, the, the 
overwhelming majority of these folks are, are you know, this gets back to also these are humans uh, and they are generally doing good things. So if you can establish those two things, then I think the it's it doesn't necessarily mean you just open the borders, you get rid of our immigration system. But I think it does say we need a a much different immigration system than what we have, one that is more liberal, easier, um, maybe still has limits. Okay. If there are limits needed for compromise, if there are limits needed for practical reasons, whatever, that's okay. That's a perfect conversation to have. But if you if you don't accept the first two, that it's really hard to get here and that generally it's, it's good if people do get here, um, then you really can't get to the, the latter stuff. And then, you know, on the welfare state stuff, I mean, look, you know, I want limits on the welfare state. I don't have a problem with limiting welfare benefits um, to uh, people who are you know, undocumented or illegal or whatever, I, you know. Um, but in general, that's not the, that, that might be a political issue, but that's not a huge problem. Uh, the, the, the big problem with immigration is the system. That's the big problem. And that's where we need to start. Um, and then we can, we can debate the margins all day long. And I'm fine with that. You know, um, I'm not an, I'm not a open borders absolutist that I think you're the devil. If you think, uh, Hey, we maybe shouldn't allow, you know, just unlimited, uh, migration. Um, okay, that's fine. Um, but, but that's a long way from what we have right now. I mean, right now, we can't even get, uh, I mean, we're in the midst of a multi-year labor shortage, um, at least, it, you know, uh, at least I would say a, a historically tight labor market. Um, we have uh, uh, PhDs that are now heading to Canada. Um, you can't get a, a visa if you're a semiconductor engineer from New Zealand. Um that's the kind of craziness, you know, visa backlogs in the millions of people. These are people lawfully trying to come here. If you don't fix that stuff first, then the rest of this is just, you know, it's just a distraction. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it, I say it so often it's on the remnant bingo card is that my preferred immigration policy is to have one. Yeah. Right. You know, and there's a bipartisan consensus. No one will admit to it of not having one. It's just a hot mess. And I think, Democrats have a identity politics fueled blind spot to like some of these problems and Republicans have an identity politics fueled blind spot to other problems. And um, at the same time, you know, it's it's, you know, America has I was just looking at these numbers recently, something like 25 million immigrants living here and then but another 25 million or so uh, first generation Americans living here. The there is not this country is not nearly as anti-immigrant as it's painted as right. I mean, it's like it's to me it's very much like the free speech argument. People love to talk about how free uh, America is cracking down on free speech, and there are problems of infringement on free speech to be sure. But America is like wildly pro-free speech. That's why we freak out whenever we see infringements on it, right? Yeah. And um. And so, yeah, I would have a compl- I have no problem with a complete overdue of the visa system. It's it's nuts. Um, but at the same time, you're not going to be able to buy the kind of streamlined, efficient, sane legal immigration policies that you want until you reassure a lot of Americans that it's actually hard to come here illegally. Yeah, right. And that's and that's again why I I I applaud my colleagues' efforts to try to gamify all of this, just so people might learn more or to to kind of create that data visualization because i don't i don't think the vast majority of americans um understand just how darn impossible it is and how the system is screwy in all sorts of ways um you know i mentioned semiconductor engineers right we have an industrial policy right now we're spending tens of billions of dollars on uh, giant factories to build semiconductors, supposedly for national security, and yet we have uh, an immigration system that doesn't essentially, you know, stamp a green card to every person who gets a, a engineering PhD in the United States or computer science or whatever. They they we're sending them home, um, even though this is something that's a desperate need, supposedly, for national security. It just all makes no sense. Um, and so we we have to start really with an understanding of how broken the system is. And then, like I said, we can, I'm happy, if we do this, it's, I'm, I'm happy to debate the, the levels and the, and the, and you know, the, that, that's, that's, that's a, it's a, that's a great place to be in because we're not there now. Yeah, no, that's fair. So, I mean, I get a curiosity, like, 
I have my answers to this, but I'm 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 curious. What is your explanation for Switzerland? Right. <laughs> Everyone wants to compare us to these crappy countries, right? I mean, I, I don't want to be, comp- I, I don't, Hungary is not our benchmark, right? Um, and no one compares us to England because England's too much like us that it doesn't, it's not a useful comparison. Same thing really with Canada. We don't really compare ourselves. They want to compare, compare us to China. They want to compare us to Japan. They want to compare us to these places again, I think because of the will to power of these experts who want to be put in charge. But yeah. like Switzerland has a really strict immigration policy. Um, they, I don't know what their industrial policy is. I do know they manu- they have a more robust industrial sector than I think anybody else in Europe. Um, and they're richer than we are. Like per capita, I, I yeah. think they're like the only halfway non sort of oil, non petro state that is actually richer than us on a per capita basis. Do you have a working theory about, about the Switzerland, about Switzerland? Is it just so awesome because it's so pretty and like they have a lot of cheese? I mean, what? no, I mean, I, um, well, first of all, I'm pretty sure Switzerland is still poorer on a per capita, uh, GDP basis. But anyway, that, that aside, yeah, they're a rich place, but you know, Switzerland is, so Switzerland is, is very, uh, weird in some senses and that, um, they have a lot of very free market aspects, uh, mixed with a kind of some statist aspects as well. I mean, their agriculture sector, for example, is, uh, insanely protected, which is why ag- uh, produce there is so crazy expensive. But then they have these other parts of their system that's very open, very free. Um, but you know, I, I don't have a, I don't know, a great answer for, for why other than, um, you know, look, it, it, there's no, there's no strict recipe for getting things exactly right, but you do need some basics. And I think they, they get the basics right in terms of uh, having a relatively free economy and having uh, a, uh, a good rule of law. Um, but, uh, you know, if you don't, you got to start with those things. I, and I, I'm not really aware of there being a really robust Swiss industrial policy that I'm, that I'm aware of. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there is. I just know that they actually do have like a, an actual fairly thriving industrial sector for a country that's small. Um, I just Googled it and per capita GDP U S was $70,248 in 2021 and 91,000. Nine hundred ninety-one dollars for Switzerland. So hmm. um, there you go. But I think part of my answer would be because this gets to a lot of things. Is yeah. small countries can do a lot of things that big countries can't. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, like even Rousseau, who this podcast is no friend of Rousseau's, um, thought all that crap about the social contract and the general will couldn't work anywhere larger than than Geneva. Yeah, right? I mean, like. Little like Singapore can get Singapore is like one of the only ones that we can talk about where you have to sort of give some props for like state economic planning kind of thing. Um, in part because it's small, it's an island, and um, you can get away with things when you're sort of it's sort of like a Dunbar's number of political economy where you have yeah. a small group that has a certain esprit de corps that comes with it, but like. This is this moves outside of the globalization and economic policy stuff. But this was one of the points that the founders were really into was that you cannot have a big continental country governed as if it's a tiny little place. It's just it's too big. It's too sprawling. There are too many other constituencies involved. And so you need a system that works at scale. And um, I don't know what this it seems to me. The Swiss system, which is very much like ours, lots of federalism and all that kind of stuff. Um, can work for a small country, but it still couldn't work for us because we're just we're just too honking big. Yeah. Um, no, I, that yeah, it strikes me as as uh, as good a theory as any. Um, it's only a partial theory. I'm sure there are. Other, I mean, Kevin Williamson would tell you that part of it is also that sort of getting to your rule of law thing and transparency thing. The Swiss are nuts about like good government. Right. And they, have, they have good bureaucrats. Like there is such a thing as a good bureaucrat, right? And who actually cares about telling the truth both up and down um, and fo- following the law. And they have, they have fair courts and all that kind of stuff. That matters a lot. 
Yeah, right. And well, and, and you know, going back to your your size point, that uh, it's it, you know, look, I think the United States has some some good bureaucrats too, but we just have a ton of them, right? So in purely a numbers game, you're going to end up with with uh, well, easier, uh, well, more people likely to not be good bureaucrats and more opportunity to be uh, bad a bad bureaucrat, right? Right. And one bad bureaucrat can undo the work of lots of good bureaucrats. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so if you had to um you had to score it, who which team do you think is putting more points on the board as a political matter towards statism, industrial policy, protectionism at this point? Is it are the Republicans doing more damage, you know, or are Democrats? Could you argue that because Republicans used to be on team good guys? And now they're not that it's the damage is really because it's made it bipartisan. How do you look at our political climate right now and 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 stop from killing yourself? Yeah, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a slightly different question. The answer is red wine. It's the answer is always red wine, actually. Uh, no, the I, I actually you stole my thesis. No, my my view is that part of the reason why. Uh, trade and industrial policy has gotten markedly worse is that uh, the the traditional Republican check on bad behavior um, by Democrats have, have been, you know, kind of into industrial policy and, and protectionism for a long, long time. You know, we we think of all oh, Clinton and Obama, but we forget about guys like Dick Gebhardt and others. There were a lot of, uh, and even, I mean, Nancy Pelosi and others that are still there, you know, just have long been fans of that stuff. Joe Biden, you know, wasn't great on this stuff when he was in Congress. Um, but so you had, though, a, a, a wall of, uh, from a Republican side on these issues. And that's, that's not, now the wall has some, some big golden doors in it uh, put there by a certain president, right? So I think that you combine the, the kind of Trump effect um, and eroding some of that traditional resistance Combine that with uh, a Democratic Party that remains uh, committed to that stuff, and you end up where where we are. Uh, the The other thing I would add is that it goes back to that race to the bottom stuff. I mean, I think a lot of Washington, um, leaving aside policy, legitimate policy issues. You know, China does raise legitimate policy issues, uh, for example. Um, but you um, you have both sides think that tariffs and industrial policy and this stuff is the secret sauce to winning a cadre of voters, mainly in the industrial Midwest. And thus, they both have to cater to that. So even if the rest of the country isn't into it, they're catering to that. And they both sides see it. and They're both fighting each other. Well, oh, yeah, you do this. Well, I'll do this. And um, and it, again, it, it fuels itself. So I think we see more and, and, and more of that. Um, so, you know, it's a tough it's a tough place to be right now. But I will say the good news uh, is that, you know, we haven't seen cratering public support for uh, open trade and globalization generally. In fact, it's basically where it was. If the I mean, Democratic side, it's it's even up even further. But the Republican side hasn't hasn't collapsed. Um and we're doing some polling that we're actually going to get into this more and really look at what people really think about these issues. Um so that's some good news. The other good news is that, you know, for all of this talk about deglobalization and, and new um, reshoring and all of that, you know, global trade has uh, and around the world has basically plateaued at its very, very, very high level. Um, it's increasing in areas like digital trade and trade and services. In the United States, we're still importing. We're still having tons of trade. Even with China, we're still trading. So, you know, the markets are still doing their thing, even if politicians all are trying, you know, uh, crawling over themselves to, to be protectionists. So, you know, that's, that's where I, why, why I don't find myself at the bottom of the red wine bottle while I'm only halfway through it is because, um, you know, there's still a lot of good stuff happening out there. Uh, I just, you know, the rhetoric in Washington is, is pretty unbearable. Okay, Scott. So we, we got to go. I know you got to go, go drink a big vat of red wine, but why don't you sort of walk through where listeners who are interested in this stuff, where they can go, when they can find it, all that kind of thing. 
Right. Well, first of you assume I'm not drinking right now, Jonah. It's nice <laughs> of you. Uh, but beyond that, the, the project is called Defending Globalization. We're house, hosting it at the Cato website. Um, we're rolling out new essays every other week. Um, and like I said, all sorts of other multimedia content over the next year. Uh, and so again, it's just at the Cato website, Defending Globalization. Hopefully, if you Google it, the search engine optimization gods will find it for you. Uh, and then you can find everything, everything you have there. All right. So that's great. Uh, thanks for coming on again. Open door policy. We have, we have, we have no borders when it comes to Scott Lindsay, come on the remnant. So you can come anytime. I'll just not show up in your living room some night. <laughs> that's great. Okay. So Scott Lindsay has left the studio and, um, he's sort of the perfect guest to have before I depart because I'm exhausted and he's basically one of his guests you just put on autopilot and, um, do check it out. I mean, I saw some of, as I was saying, I saw some of the stuff that they're putting up and he sent me a whole bunch of materials and it looks like it'll be a great sort of resource when you want to get into fights with people about things like industrial policy and, and protectionism and whatnot. And, um, other than that, uh, I hope you guys like the Megan McArdle podcast. I have, I always love talking to Megan and, um, look to listen to me from the road. Um, we're going to see what we can do about that on the special dispatch, uh, um, podcast feed and i will certainly be recording the solo from by that point i assume oregon and um and uh, you know we'll see what else what other you know bells and whistles we can throw your way so thanks for listening if you are not a subscriber to the dispatch please do that um we're gonna have more and more uh subscriber only uh podcast uh content and um you, we wouldn't want you to miss it and um, I'll see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast. <laughs>